Good morning. Happy good, Sabbath. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath. Well, Barbara, Danielle, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We just wish you all, all of you, a blessed Sabbath. We're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Barbara, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's lesson? I'd love lesson? to. Dear Father in Heaven, we're thankful for another day to study Your Word, Lord. We're so excited about this lesson as we dig deeper into what happens when we die and the hope that we have in the resurrection of You. So we ask, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds and our ears to all that you would have us to hear. And may your word only be spoken here today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This week's Sabbath School lesson is titled The Old <clears throat> Testament Hope. And what an incredible lesson it is as we see our patriarchs dedicating their life to a hope. A hope that death is not all there is. And that's just incredible. The memory text found in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19 tells us, by faith Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son. And take note, verse 19 it says, he, Moses, considered the fact, I'm in, he, Moses, he, Abraham, considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. That's verses 19. It's incredible, incredible to know that Abraham's faith, his faithful conduct, is the product of an attitude of faith. This faith consists of trust. It consists of confidence, reliability, and faithfulness. You know, verse 19 is very important for the, for the lesson this week. It tells us that Abraham considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. Abraham's courage to set up to offer his own son Isaac, as God had instructed, was based on his total faith in the power of God to resurrect Isaac. This is the only way Abraham could reconcile God's promise that Isaac was to be his own heir. This is why at the end of Psalm, of, of that verse, verse 19 of Hebrews 11, it tells us that figuratively speaking, Abraham did receive him back. See, as far as Abraham was concerned, his son Isaac was going to die. And when God altered the test and restored Isaac to his father, it was as if Isaac had indeed returned from the dead. What an incredible experience. As a brief overview to this week's Sabbath School lesson, I would like to propose the following. Through transgression, because of sin, our first parents and every human being thereafter, you and I, became sinful and are condemned to die. Death is depressing. Death is cold. It is unnatural. It robs life of certainty and meaning and abruptly breaks relationships. Dying does not make sense. As humans, we are never meant to die. It is only because of sin that we die. You know, the good news for you and for me, for human beings, is that in the Garden of Eden and in the midst of the darkness of despair and before God pronounced the punishment on our fallen parents, God gave them hope by introducing the covenant of grace. As we read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9, this hope begun with God's search for Adam and Eve, after they had sinned and hid themselves from God. Then in Genesis 3.15, God continues to provide hope when he announces that he will send the promised seed, Jesus Christ, to defeat Satan. And here's how the Scripture states it. Genesis 3.15, 
By now we should know this by memory, for we read it many times. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, says Jesus, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, as in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, and you shall bruise his heel, as in the devil will cause healing. I mean the bruising. God's message to Adam and Eve and to humanity, found in Genesis 3.15, brings hope and encouragement because it announces that Satan and death will be defeated. In this passage of Scripture, God promises Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity that through His grace, He would establish a fortification, a defense against sin. The verse tells us that God would create a hatred between the serpent and the woman. That means between Satan's followers and God's people. This would disrupt man's relationship with Satan and open the way for a renewal relationship with God. At the cross, Jesus fulfilled His pledge to be humanity's surety in the covenant. His cry, it is finished, as we read in John 19, verses 30, marked the completion of His mission. With His own life, Christ paid the penalty required by God's violated law, thus guaranteeing the salvation of the repented human race. At the moment, at that moment on the cross, at Calvary, Christ's blood rectified the covenant of grace. Through faith in His atoning blood, repented sinners are adopted as sons and daughters of God, thus becoming heirs of eternal life. At the cross, Satan, sin, and death are defeated. Good news. These are wonderful news. Hope is a gift from God Himself to us. The Old Testament hope is grounded on the biblical teachings of the final resurrection of the dead. The Old Testament church lived by this hope. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of His kingdom. They, the hope of resurrection is the hope in the restoration of life together with fullness in being, a new body, a new mind, and a personality that is subsequent to death. Because humanity, because you and I are subject to death, there must be resurrection if we are to experience life beyond the grave. Throughout the Old Testament, God's messengers have expressed hope in the resurrection. It begins with Job and culminates with Daniel. And between these two, several others, like King David and Isaiah, testify to that. The hope of the resurrection, for which we have solid evidence, should encourage us to look forward to a better future beyond this present world in which death is the destiny of all. This week's Sabbath School lesson reflects on how the notion of the final resurrection unfolded in the Old Testament times. We will study and review the statements made by Job, a couple of psalmists, inclu including David, and the, prophetic, and the prophet Isaiah and Daniel. Daniel, in spite of all the tragedy, Job believed that he would see God. What does this mean for us today? So, Sunday's lesson, I shall see God. And the, the text that we are focusing on, the writer of the lesson is focusing on, is Job chapter 19, 25 to 27. It's a statement, a mighty statement of Job that reverberates all the way down to us. Um, and those words that he said, once we will read them, they will ring. There have been songs written with these statements, and they're just such so powerful. So let's start by reading this text together. Job 19, verses 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. 
And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my her heart yearns within me. Oh, such a beautiful, powerful words. And when I think of Job, and in time, like in the time frame of the Bible, uh, time divisions, when he was, he's in the Old Testament, he really doesn't have all the knowledge that we have. At least that's what we thought. But these words that he said so powerfully identify the fact that he knew very well the plan of salvation, intricately, every step, every uh, step that was going to take place. Uh, even though their written wasn't, uh, you know, they didn't have the, all the written word that we have, the information had been passed down, and the Lord had made sure that his believers throughout the earth know, knew it. Now, he's made some statements in here that we'll review, but one of the things that he said that is that he is going to see the Lord face to face. Was it because anybody had seen the Lord face to face before that or during his time? No. As a matter of fact, when we read in John chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible tells us, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And then in Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6.16, it talks about who has immortality because he's talking about seeing God after He dies, obviously at a resurrection. He's making an a allusion to a resurrection. And in 1 Timothy 6.16, which is in the New Testament again, who alone has immortality, dwelling in an approachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power, amen, and he's referring to God. So this is where we're starting the lesson, and this is the basis of it. Now, this text that I, in Job, I'm sure that once I read it, you recognize it, you've heard it, it's probably the most quoted text in the Bible. It's arguably the most quoted, a lot of people say it is. And we can actually find it engraved in a lot of Christian tombs, you know, for I know that my Redeemer leavers and I shall see him. Um, it's just a powerful statement. And when he knows, when, when we're talking about Job, he knows his God is alive and he calls him the Redeemer. And when we're looking at the original language, it, it's using the word goel, G-O-E-L, uh, in the original language, and it means kinsman redeemer, it means defender, vindicator, protector, and sort of makes us allusion to the story of Ruth and when she claims this right from the family. Um, but Job just continues with that assurance that we see in, in his uh, words. But many times people stop short of quoting and they just quote the first verse, which is the one, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Um, but his statement continues just as powerful. Uh, he says, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Um, I myself will see him with my own eyes and not another. How my heart yearns within me. And we just notice his personal tone, very personal. But I think it takes, it's important for us to look back to see what did Job go through? Where is he coming from when he makes the statement? Because that speaks even more powerfully. When we're looking at his life, we know that the first statement that we have in the very beginning of the book of Job, Job 1.1, 1, 1, it says, there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. So we know that much about him he had a very close relationship with the Lord. I mean, he was no less than an Abraham. He was no less than some of the Old Testament figures that we think of very close to the Lord. He was upright, and he was close to, to the Lord. But we also know what happened in his life. We know that eventually, without him really knowing, while he's in the dark, the devil comes, and we won't read all the text, but I'll remind you a little bit of the story. Uh, from the Bible, is that the devil comes walking, you know, comes into this uh, central meeting, so to speak, and the Lord says, where are you coming from? And he says, from walking to and from the earth. And then he's, 
claiming, in other, in, other, in other words, ownership of the earth because of the fallen race. And God says, wait a minute, haven't you seen? You don't really own the earth. There is there my faithful follower, Job. And uh, the devil says, well, it's only because you haven't touched him. Uh, you haven't allowed me to touch him. You've just given him too many blessings. And God allows him to touch Job. So he becomes the central where God is put on the spot to prove himself that this Job is following him because he believes in him, not because God has done something special for him. And in that process, we know what happens. His possessions, he loses all his possessions, his household, he loses his children, uh, his wife curses him, and he, he loses his health. He has boils all over his body. And, he, and then even his, all his friends are basically saying, it's your fault. You, you're probably getting all this curse because y you've you know, done something wrong. So in, in effect, he's losing everything. And despite all of that, he's coming boldly to the throne of God, asking the Lord throughout Job, through all the chapters, Lord, why is this happening to me? But yet, he comes up with this statement that we have so uh, beautifully looked at. But then he has another t statement that I like to quote. It's in Job 13, 15. And he says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. And we can see he'll boldness. I mean, in boldness, he goes and argues with the Lord about why this is happening to him. But yet, even with that boldness, he stays, stands back and he says, if he, even if he slays me, I will trust him. And we know other parts in the Bible that we are told in the New Testament, in Hebrews 4.16, to come boldly to the throne of grace. But that's exactly what he does. And he's in the Old Testament times. He doesn't have the benefit of that wording written, but he knows it. And then we know Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who also make a similar claim when they say, you know, king, O oh king, we will not obey you. The, our God can save us, but even if he doesn't save us, we will still obey him. And that sounds sort of like Job, doesn't it? Uh, what does Job say? And so I'd like to re-review this text that we opened with and kind of leave us thinking of that because this is a lesson in our lives. Job left a little legacy for us to look at in his trust for the Lord we are to have the same exact trust, the same kind of obedience, and understand our plan of salvation just as clearly as he did. So here it goes, Job 19, 25, 27. Let's close the Monday, I mean Sunday's lesson by pondering these words. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Amen. Amen. You know, Job knew that death would not have the final word. Amen. He knew that he could rely on God. What a tremendous faith. I shall see God, he said, and you and I have to have that same faith. Barbara, Amen. Monday's lesson. All right. Explain, explain it to us. The power of the grave. We're going to spend our, <clears throat> the first part of this lesson in Psalms 49. And we see here that David has an assurance of a final resurrection. And so we're going to look a little bit at the contrast between that assurance of having um, God there for the resurrection and those who perish without that assurance. So let's jump into Psalms 49, 6 through 14. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in a multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, <clears throat> that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees 
wise men die, like the foolish and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. And many people do that. We see many lands today where people are, that are named after people. Nevertheless, man, through, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their saying, Selah. Like sheep, they are laid to the grave. Death shall feed them, feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from their dwelling. <clears throat> so we see that Psalm speaks of this false confidence, the foolish who trust and boast in their wealth, in their multitude of riches, call their lands by their own names, uh, only to bless themselves. Verse 18 says, though while he lives, he blesses himself. And we just see that, that um, uh, so often today in life. In Psalms 49, 17, we see when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. So we see that there really is no difference in death. We all go to the same uh, place. But we have those who are foolish and those who are, are wise. And we see these foolish men wishing for other man's approval. Um, I, I used to hear a saying many years ago that the one who dies with the most toys wins. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true because if you don't die with Christ, you miss that hope of res resurrection. I want to look at verse 14 again. But I'm going to look at it in the, in the uh, American Standard Version. So verse 14 says, As the sheep, as sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. And their form shall be for Sheol to consume, so they have no habitation. Here the term Sheol is translated grave as it is in many other passages. The term is found 66 times in the Hebrew Bible. In the majority of cases, its meaning is synonymous with the grave. Both the wicked and the righteous descend into Sheol. Psalm 1619 says, <clears throat> Therefore my heart is glad, and my, my glory rejoices. My flesh shall dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow the Holy One to undergo decay. Nowhere in the Bible does Sheol, is Sheol described as a shadowy underworld where the dead or where human souls or spirits continue their existence. The word Sheol is designated for grave, and we see it is a place of the dead in, in the majority of cases. Um, we see this like 57 times. But there's also five times where it refers to as death. Um, once the realm of death, once the deepest death, depths, gates of death once. David rejoices that after death he will rest in peace and will not be forgotten by the Lord, but will be resurrected into a new life and will not experience lasting destruction. And that lasting destruction is shakat, which means destruction corruption, decay, or the pit. Then we go on, let's take a look, go back over and look at Job. He says in um, Job 121, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return, which says that really the ones with the most toys doesn't do them any good in the tomb. So he also says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. In 1 Timothy, we see, for we, are, we have brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we carry nothing out. Um, <clears throat> so 
um, we see this radical contrast then. On one side are the foolish who perish, and even though trying to find assurance in their own transient possessions and accomplishments, in contrast, the wise behold beyond the human saga and the prison of the grave, the glorious reward of God that he has reserved for them. So those, those who, who grasp the concept realize that th this earth is just a place we're passing through and that our eyes are constantly on heaven. 1 Peter 1.4 says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. With this perception in mind, the psalmist could say with confidence, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Uh, <clears throat> we look then to this future resurrection depicted, bringing hope, assurance, meaning to this persistent existence, present existence. So the wise will receive far more glorious, everlasting reward than what the foolish could gather to themselves. And I want to end this by reading to you Testimonies to the Church, uh, volume 4, page 525. Those who closely connect with God may not be prosperous in the things of this life. And that's important to remember. It's not what we have here on earth. They may often be sorely tried and afflicted. Joseph was maligned and persecuted because he preserved his virtue and integrity. David that chosen messenger of God was hunted like a beast of prey by his wicked enemies. Daniel was cast into the lion's den because he was true and unyielding in his alliance to God. Job was deprived of, this, of his worldly possessions and afflicted in his body that was absorbed by his relatives and friends, as Daniel mentioned. These examples of human steadfastness and might of divine power are a witness to the world of the faithfulness of God's promise. These patriarchs understood what it meant to be here for God and not for self. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Barbara. As uh, you've just uh, uh, seen uh, as Barbara reviewed uh, Monday's lesson, <clears throat> Psalm 49 um, is a touching expression of hope in the resurrection. Tuesday's lesson looks at Psalm 71, which also speaks of hope of the resurrection. Uh, the author of this prayer, by the way, Psalm 71 is a prayer, a prayer for God's help uh, in old age. And that is extremely comforting for me, I have to admit, even though I don't think that my age reflects oldiness for that matter. Exactly. But the author of this prayer, by the way, is not mentioned in the psalm. The psalm doesn't say who wrote it. But the text makes it apparent that he is old. You read that in verses 9 and 18 of uh, Psalm 71. And that he was faithful to God all his life. Verses 5, 6, and 17 of that particular verse. Thus the theologians assume that this psalm was written by David. When we read the psalm, it becomes evident that the Lord was with the psalmist from birth and that he has done great things for him. So David asked for God's protection from his enemies. <clears throat> now, I don't have time to read the entire psalm, so I'm going to concentrate on a few verses. But I would like to encourage you, when you ha have an opportunity, to actually read both Psalms 49 and 71. In Psalm 71, verses 10 and 11, David seeks security and hope from God while surrounded by enemies and false accusers who say that God has forsaken him. Let's read it. Psalm 71, verses 10 and 11. It says, and this is David praying to God, for my enemies speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life Take counsel together. Then verse 11, saying, God is forsaking him, pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. How often have you and I 
felt that sort of pressure. Amid his trials, David finds comfort and assurance in recalling how God had cared for him in the past. This is all part of a prayer. So first, David acknowledges that God had upheld him from birth and even had taken him out of his mother's womb. Verses 6 of Psalm 71, which says, By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. Then David acknowledges that God had taught him from his youth. Verses 17 of Psalm 71. Oh God, you have taught me from my youth, he says. And to this day I declare your wondrous work. No wonder. Consequently, David chooses to put his trust in the Lord. The very first verse of, seven, uh, of, of Psalm 71, he says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. And that's really a prayer that I encourage you to have with God every day. With the certainty that God was his rock and his fortress, in a time of distress, David pleads with God for help and deliverance. Verse 7, be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. Verses 9, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength faints. Verses 12, oh God, do not be far from me. Oh, my God, make haste to help me. And then David adds in verses 20 of Psalm 71, You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depth of the earth. Wonderful verse. We want to spend a few minutes on this. God not only restores physical strength and health, but also has the power to resurrect. And that's really what David says, resurrect me. The psalmist believes and hopes that God will bring him up. The Hebrew words used for bring him up is halah, A-L-A-H, which means to get it up, to ascend. He believes that God will bring him up from the depths, from the depths of the earth, of the grave. The, the word for depths, the Hebrew word for depths is the home, T-E-H-O-M, which literally means from the abyss, the deep of the earth, which can be figuratively described as the grave. See, this statement that God would bring David up from the depth of the earth hints at and describes a physical resurrection. That's what it does. This is why the New Living Translation is infused with this hope and translates this sentence on of verse 20 as follows. You will restore to life, uh, you restored me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. Encouraging. David was suffering and in deep distress. He probably felt as if the earth was about to swallow him up. Yet because he trusted God, and he was faithful to him all his life, David expresses in a positive assurance that God will rescue him from the depths of distress, distress and will set him in a place of comfort and security. Here is how David ends his prayer. Verses 21, 23, and 24 of Psalm, of, of Psalm 71. You shall increase my greatness, O God, and comfort me on every side. Verse 23. My lips will greatly rejoice when I sing to you. And my soul? Oh well, it will be redeemed. Verse 24. My tongue also shall talk of your righteousness all day long. Oh, David is an encouraging example for me and for you. David was a believer. 
And he demonstrated that when he was subjected to shameful and painful accusations, and when he went through many bitter troubles, he re remained confident that the Lord would restore his honor. David was willing to face death because he knew that the God he loved has the power to resurrect and bring him back to life. In the end, you and I should learn from David's faith and trust in God. What is important to grasp? See, what is important to grasp is that whatever our situation, God is there. God cares. Ultimately, we need to understand that our hope isn't found on this life, but in the life to come. The eternal life we may have in Jesus after our resurrection at the second coming. Daniel, two resurrections and two very different outcomes. Please explain. Wednesday's lesson, it's titled, Your Dead Shall Live. I must say, when I read that title, my heart kind of did a skip and a jump. <laughs> it was a joyful skip and a jump. Um, because just that imagination, my imagination immediately went to seeing some of my beloved ones that have passed. But the lesson is really doing a contrast. There is a resurrection and there's a resurrection. And that's what we really need to know and to see. But nonetheless, even comparing resurrections, even before that, what a blessing, the fact that there is a resurrection for those believers that will be in heaven with the Lord at some point in time after the resurrection. I mean, imagine what life would be. And the lesson kind of asks that, asks that questions to make us ponder towards the end of it. Like, what if this life was all there was? And what if, as we struggle and all, and it ends for, so tragically for most of us in some form or another, it was the end. I can't even imagine that. I don't want to imagine that. So let's look at our lesson. Our lesson starts with, it's comparing two close by texts in the book of Isaiah, uh, the Old Testament prophet. V chapter 26, verse 14 is the first one. And it says, they are dead. They will not live. They are deceased. They will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. So obviously, there is a group that that joyful resurrection doesn't seem to be for. But then as we go, just skip a couple of verses down to verse 19, there seems to be an opposite group. It says in verse 19, Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So we see a resurrection, a definite resurrection here in these two verses. So we want to see the comparison. There's obviously two different groups. And... I like to move us uh, along to look at Revelation 21.8 because the Revelation 21.8 in the New Testament, at the end of New Testament, as it talks about the future, it talks about who is in that group that's not going to be benefiting from the resurrection. So let's read it together. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we can identify a little bit at that group. And going ahead and... and of course, they will be resurrected. But for a second right. death. Right. So that's what it says, which is the second death. You know, when we don't have the time to cover the thousand years and all the steps of the second coming. But in a very summary short, the second coming is when the Lord decides that it's the end and the time has come to an end, the allotted for all of us, then he will return with the host of heaven. And those that are dead, as we know in First Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, 
13.3.18, in summary, it says that those that are believers, dead in Christ, shall be, and they are buried, they shall be resurrected. And those that are alive at that time, both of these groups will be risen, to, like lifted up together and caught with the Lord in the air, and they'll be together. And then we know from Revelation for the thousand years that while the, but the believers that, those that are not believers, those that are, as we just read in chapter, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, those that are not believers will be put to sleep. And they'll be dead for a thousand years. Why? During the thousand years in heaven, the believers that have been risen and those that have caught up in the air and are together with the Lord will basically will be spending a thousand years reviewing the books and seeing why the Lord made the decisions he's made. How magnanimous is the Lord to do that with us? And then after the thousand years are over, then they will be resurrected to what chapter, Revelation 21 verse 8 calls uh, they'll, they'll be to be judged and to be uh, put in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So they'll have that second death. So I hope that helps a little bit on clarification. But let's continue reviewing Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, uh, which says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up. So we know it's not going to be that they're going to, when, when the, on that second death, it's not going to be that they're roasting in fire, how Christianity sometimes portrays. Here it says very clearly, they shall burn, it shall burn them up, say the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. So it's not going to be an eternal, like they're going to be suffering eternally, but rather it will be an eternal effect uh, of their punishment where they will be put to sleep or the second death for never to be resurrected again. Now, very interesting, in the Old Testament, we know that, the, that Daniel knew, just like Job, he knew the plan of salvation very clearly. We read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. This is what he says. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, those that we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, 13 to 18, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. It's a final done. Like their effect of their punishment will be final and eternal. Daniel 12, 12 through 13 continues. Here is the angel talking to uh, Daniel and it's telling him as he's, basically he's getting a vision uh, about the end times. And the angel in his Grace and magnanimous is telling Daniel, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you, in other words, you, Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall rest. That's what he's going to do. He's going to pass away and he's going to rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Yeah. I mean, very clearly said by the angel to Daniel. Very incredible clarification for all of us. And we know that in Jonah, Jonah described his um, being in the, when he was swollen up in, by the whale, he described his being in the bottom of the ocean as a grave. He described that experience as a grave. And we know also that he was called out of that pit by God. Jonah said, I won't read the text, but basically that's what it said. I want to close with two texts. Uh, Matthew 12, 40, Jesus himself described his own burial, just similar to Jonah's experience. He says, so Jesus says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So obviously, he very clearly said he was going to be in a grave. I like to... to and by reading John chapter 5, 28, 29, it says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So we need to choose God and choose life. 
Thanks so much, Danielle. Barbara, I'm glad that Thursday is a very hopeful lesson. It is. Talk to Those who sleep in the dust. Now, the, the New Testament speaks much about Christ's uh, second coming Amen. and his resurrection. But so does the Old Testament when we, when we stop and, and look back. We have, we have scriptures in the Old Testament, too, that, that share that. And we see from a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that um, they had an idea of what was going on. And we see that through the story of Martha. In John eleven twenty four. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Now, Jesus was telling um, Martha that Lazarus would rise again. And so we can see here that she understood that it would be in the last days. Mm -hmm. But Christ was going to raise him right away. And so we see that she didn't understand that he was going to resurrect him now mm -hmm. from the dead. But um, she was looking at when he came, when Christ returned, that that would happen. And so um, even the Jews, the, the, the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees had an idea of what would go on, but they had different beliefs. So even then there was confusion about, about death. And we see um, in Acts uh, 23, 8, for Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So we see that even the Sadducees and Pharisees um, uh, struggled with that. But Daniel talks about this resurrection of, of the, the dead. And Daniel 12, 1 says, again, at that time, Michael shall stand up that great prince who stands over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. So we see that in, in the last chapter of Daniel, he's talking about this hope. And Daniel 1 refers to Michael, your prince. And often we see in the Old Testament um, Michael um, used for, the, for, for Jesus. Um, and so we see that this, um, this last book is culminating with the manifestation of Christ's coming. And so um, he here is the prince of the host, our Michael. Daniel 9.25 also talks about Michael, the great prince. Matt, Daniel 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again, even the wall, even in troublous times. So we see that term, Michael, your Prince, used then as well. But if we move on now <clears throat> to Job... We know that Job understood this issue of resurrection. Mm -hmm. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at, at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that, my, that in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. So he's looking, Job is looking forward to that time. Psalms 49, 15, which we looked at King David, remind you again that God, he said, God redeemed my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. What a, what a blessed hope and a powerful statement. In Psalm 71, 20, we see, you who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up from the depths of the earth. Isaiah, we just keep going. You see how many verses there are here in, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead shall live together with my dead, thy, uh, dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing. 
who, you who dwell in the dust, for, the, for your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So we see that. Um, um, Danielle talked about Jonah, how similarly that was to Christ and the three days in, in the belly of the whale. And it's interesting because Hosea also um, talks about it, but he looks at it as well as not just a physical resurrection, but a spiritual revival as well. And return to the Lord, the spiritual revival of returning to the Lord, being raised from the dead into new life. And isn't that what happens to us in baptism? We go into the grave and are raised again into a new life. There's so much symbology in between baptism and death and, and the resurrection of hope that we have. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I wanted to finish up here just shortly with Daniel 12, 2. Because when I learned about Daniel 12, 2 and what Ellen White has to say t about it, I got really excited because it says, and many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Now we know from studying the Bible and studying the judgment that these resurrections don't take place at the same time. The resurrection of the righteous, is, as Daniel told us, um, comes when Christ comes back for his second coming. Then the, the, the wicked are raised when he comes with the new Jerusalem right. at the very end. A thousand years later. A thousand years later. Right. But here's what Ellen White has to say about, um, <clears throat> about this. Because we also, but before I read this, I just want to say one more thing. We know too that there will be a special resurrection there will be a special resurrection. And we want to make sure that we understand what happens in that resurrection. And this is what she has to say. Graves are opened, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel 12, 2 says, All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message shall come forth from the tomb glorified. So who's in the third angel's message? Isn't the third angel's message the time we're living in? So this is, this is the time of the end. <clears throat> this is from 1844 forward. Come from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. They also which pierced him. So those who crucified Christ, those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies, and the most violent opposers of the truth of his people are raised to behold his glory and to see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. What an exciting Absolutely. and hopeful opportunity. And I just thought I would give my final thoughts here if I yep. could really Absolutely. quickly. Absolutely. And it comes from Christ Object Lessons uh, 179. From garrets, from hovels, from dungeons, from scaffolds, from mountains and deserts, from caves of the earth, and the caverns of the sea, Christ will gather his children to himself. On earth they have been dis destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Millions have gone down to the grave, loaded with infamy because they refuse to yield to the deceptive claims of Satan. By human tribunals, the children of God have been judged the vilest criminals, but the day is near when God is himself is judge. Then decisions of the earth shall be reversed. The rebuke of his people will, shall be taken away. White robes will be given to every one of them, and they shall call them the holy people redeemed of the Lord. What an incredible picture. Isn't that just beautiful? beautiful? Just beautiful. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. Danielle, do you have any <clears throat> final, final thoughts? Yes. So I <laughs> left my Wednesday talking about the resurrection of the good resurrection and the resurrection of damnation. And why? do we have this information in the Bible and why do we review it? Why does it matter to us today? Is because we, as we are alive, we still have a choice. Amen. And uh, the Bible is very clear how we can 
avoid being in that resurrection of damnation. We, we have a choice. It's, God does not wish to, for us to be in that. And it, if we can review scripture very easily, it says in Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 30 to 32. You don't have it on the screens, but I'm going to read it, and it's in the NIV version. It says, repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Read yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. So that, and that's the invitation for us to take God at his word and at his offering of himself for us, at his incredible love, so that we can, like Daniel, say, as he said to the king uh, in uh, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, he said, uh, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. If we stand at that choice to obey God and scared of the world, we can say, like Daniel, uh, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, like not, if not this time, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And that's our example. So that we can also say, like Job in chapter 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, I will, yet I will trust him. So if something happens to me now, I will still trust him. Even so, I will defend my ways before him. In other words, my relationship with him is such that I can go boldly to him and still defend myself, but I will trust him no matter what. And then we can say, like Job again, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Thank you, Daniel. Um, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, 23, that the ultimate effect of sin is death, because as he writes in Romans chapter 3, verses 23, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The ultimate effect of salvation from sin is eternal life. And so John tells us in John chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, that whoever believes in Christ should not perish but have everlasting life. And then he tells us in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he concludes in verse 17 that for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Encouraging news. Therefore, once death has occurred, there must be a resurrection from the dead in order that those who have been forgiven from their sins through Jesus Christ may have eternal life. And those who have not been forgiven may pay the penalty of their choice. Throughout the Old and New Testament, God's messengers have expressed hope in a resurrection. And this week's lesson, we've just gone through it. So, I want to hand, I want to finish by reading um, an incredible promise found in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. And I want to read a paragraph that Ellen White wrote in Desire of Ages, pages 632. So, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29 tells us, Do not marvel. In other words, you shouldn't be surprised. We, this shouldn't be of any surprise to you and to me. Do not marvel at this. For the hour of His coming in which all who are in the graves will, will hear His voice. There is an hour. It will be here. And everyone in the grave will hear his voice. And will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life at Christ's second coming. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. This is verse 29. At the time 
um, uh, once the millennium has taken place, as Jesus descends with the new Jerusalem into a new world. Ellen G. White in The Desire of Ages, pages 632, provides the following hope and information. Christ is coming with clouds and great glory. She says, a multitude of shining angels will attend him. He will come to raise the dead and to change the living saints from glory to glory. He will come to honor those who have loved him and keep his commandments and to take them to himself. He has not forgotten them nor his promise. He has promised us that he would come. He, will, he has promised us of a resurrection and he's going to fulfill it. Then Helen White concludes the statement by saying, there will be a re linking of the family chain. It brought me tears to my eyes to know that my son and my parents and the loved ones that we know and the friends that I know that love Jesus, that formed the family, will all be resurrected. When we look upon our dead, we may think of the morning and the trump of God shall sound when the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen, amen, praise the Lord. That's the hope that you and I need to have as believers in Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for being here this morning. I want to thank you for really studying the lesson. By the way, the next two weeks will be dedicated to expand this very, very theme that we have, death and resurrection. And I want to encourage you to study that. I'm going to invite you to, close, to bow your heads as, as we thank the Lord for His incredible mercy, His grace, and His assurance of eternity with Him as we give our lives to Him. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for the, the promise, for the assurance that death is not all there is. That if we give our lives to you, that we invite you to be part of our daily life. If, Lord, we give our hearts to you and you occupy it. Lord, if we ask you to take our will and mold it into yours and to help us die for self every day, that we will fulfill the responsibilities that you have assigned to us, we will keep the commandments. We will love you with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might. And we will love each other as we love ourselves. And we will be resurrected if you come after our death into an eternal life with you. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Have a wonderful Sabbath.